Make sure I'm getting a reading there. Yeah, looks good. Okay. Cooperative Legacy Project interview number 57, November 16th, 2006. We're visiting with Quentin Loudon, Rural Electric Cooperative leader and member of the South Dakota Co-op Hall of Fame. Quentin, when and where were you born? Right here, Martin, South Dakota, 1919, August the 10th. Okay. And where was your family originally from? Um, before Missouri. You, uh, well, my mother was born in Fort Pier mm -hmm. in about 1884, five, four, I think. Mm -hmm. And my dad, he was born in Craig, Missouri. Uh, and uh, he came to this country uh, right here in 1915, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he met my mother sometime before that, and they came in, in 1970. Okay. And what was your, your dad's name? My what? Your father's name, what was it? Emmett. Emmett, Emmett. okay. You want to talk about him a little bit? What sort of a person was he? And, uh, uh, he was, uh, well, a farmer, first of all. He was raised on a, uh, a farm in, uh, in the hills right there along the Missouri River, 100 miles below Omaha, a place called Craig or Coining in that area of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, his dad... Uh, I never, never did find out much about him, and uh, there were what fourteen kids in the family. I think. Big families in those days. Yeah, and he said, my dad said, well, there I had brothers and sisters that had been born and dead before I was ever born. I think he was next to the youngest one, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he was. Uh, he came here, and of course he. Uh, uh, farms he, and uh, well uh, and uh, always raised a few cattle mm -hmm. never had a big place he never he, he had no uh, no ambitions of of getting any size it, mm -hmm. I mean just as long as he had something to eat and a place to sleep that that was about the size of his ambitions but, you know, he never, uh, and of course everybody liked him because, uh, and uh, there was an old Civil War veteran and his son moved up here before he did from the same area in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he came here. He knew, would know somebody, you know. Okay. And of course they all come up the Missouri River and mm -hmm. then from like Springfield, he had a brother in Springfield and he stopped there and, and he uh, came then on to Bennett County. I don't think, well, maybe it was Martin was here, but there weren't very many houses anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so then he and my mother came, I know, in 1917. And I was born in 1919. A twin. I have a twin brother too, by the name of Quincy, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, then later, two years later, there was another brother, Rex Loudon, and they're both deceased, and uh, I'm the only one left in our family. Okay. Uh, what about your mother? What was her name? Mabel Bunch. Mm -hmm. She was born in Fort Pier, like I said in in uh, 1884. Mm -hmm. And uh, what sort of a person was she? Uh, she, I'll show you a picture of her in there. Okay. She was a pioneer woman. Big, strong. A lot of hard work in those days. And, oh yeah, she was a hard worker. I know my dad, he liked to gamble. And, uh, Whenever uh, we needed clothes, so I, we always knew what kind of luck my dad had as to how many clothes they would buy uh, at one time. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And she was always in favor of education. Yeah. So uh, they didn't live in Martin only for a couple of years when I was born. Quincy and I were born here, and then they lived around the area, you know, various places. Yeah. And, uh, but when we were six years old, why well, she made a stipulation that we had to come so that uh, us boys could go to school in Martin. Mm-hmm. And as a result, why well, he bought a half section out west, north here, three miles that we lived. Uh, well, first he was on a leased quarter of land, then he bought a half section and built a house on it, the coldest house I ever lived in in my life. They didn't believe in putting insulation in. Well, it they, they didn't have. They either didn't have the money or they didn't want to. Yeah. Or they didn't have insulation. If you wanted insulation, it seems to me like uh, they just took paper or sawdust mm-hmm. and filled in for insulation. Mm-hmm. But and a this, lot of people thought that maybe if they did that, they'd get mice in the walls. So they yeah. Didn't so, do it at all. <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> but boy, that was a cold house. It's still sitting out here three miles, uh-huh. and we walked, uh, we either rode horseback or walked to school, and uh, uh, my two brothers, they they didn't like school very good, but for some reason, I always liked school, uh-huh. and I walked uh, the three miles here to Martin, Mm-hmm. Uh, we lived in the Martin Township so we could come to school here. Otherwise, we'd have had to pay tuition. Mm-hmm. And we wouldn't have been able to come here because we wouldn't have been in the Martin Township. But we were, so uh, I, uh, I started in Martin in 1925 in a little old uh, house over here on a, a hill, then uh, why the, at that time it was Indian country. I mean, there was uh, teepees all around the schoolhouse and mm-hmm. Indians, that's where they lived in the north part of town over there. And the white people, they lived in here where we are, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, that was kind of a, the way Martin was organized, I guess. Uh, they were the Indian people. They just come and went in those days, when uh, they decided they wanted to go somewhere. Where they just folded up their tent, loaded it in their old wagon, and got their horses harnessed. And uh, uh, the squaw, she always harnessed the horses and hooked them on the wagon, and then handed him the reins, sitting in the seat, and they took off for wherever they were going. <laughs> And they would just, that's the way they just come and went, you know. And uh, uh, I graduated from grade school in Martin, grade school. I went to high school, graduated from high school in 1937. And uh, my mother had two children before she uh, she was married to another guy before she married my father, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, my half sister then Marie Croner, she and my aunt Doat, my mother's sister who lived in Cleveland a while, they put up a deal where I was going to school in Cleveland as soon as I graduated, and they'd uh, take care of the expenses. My half sister was a school teacher, and, and she lived down in Kansas, and they had a farm. Her and her husband down there, and so she paid for my tuition, and I worked whenever I could too. And I stayed with my aunt there in Cleveland. I went to school, a place called Finn College. I think now it's Cleveland College, mm-hmm. in Cleveland, Ohio. Quite different than this area. Oh my <laughs> land. You couldn't believe. Well, just imagine, I went to a high school here that did give uh, uh, give you chemistry. We had no chemistry class. Mm-hmm. We had pretty good math classes, though, and pretty good uh, science classes. Well, and here I go there, and, hmm, and I'm going against kids in 
out of Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights high schools, you know, and they were coming to school there, and I was competing against them in, uh, for instance, chemistry. Well, uh, believe it or not, I passed. <laughs> How, I don't know. Uh, because, well, uh, one thing, uh, there are a lot of uh, young people from the Youngstown area where they were coal miners. And they were 30 years old coming to college, see. They, they said, we want to get out of the coal mining business. We want to get something else. Well, when it comes to lab and chemistry, for example, or physics, hell, they already knew how to do that. But boy, the rest of it, I'm helping them. <laughs> and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. I kind of helped them get through that part of it. They helped me with the lab part, so we both wound up pretty good. And I went to school there two years, and I decided, oh boy, I've had enough of this city. So I come back and entered Shadron, and I graduated two years later. I graduated in Shadron in 1940. Okay. What were things like down here on the, in this area during the 1930s? Was this uh, pretty tough down here? Only the toughest survived. The rest pulled out. Yeah. They all, you see, oh, we had wonderful crops. I can remember the latter 20s. I can't go back much further than that. Yeah. But the latter 20s, the crops were, oh, you know, wheat standing up like that. Mm -hmm. And even the corn, those Missourians that come in here and people from Iowa, they raised pretty good corn. You know, we had moisture. And, mm -hmm. Oh, there was nothing to ride through the prairies of grass that high horseback and your feet would be dragging in the grass see and uh, no fences and all at once in the latter 20 here these people started coming in breaking this land up and wanted to farm it that's the last thing we love we wanted uh, those of us that were already here mm -hmm. we wanted it like it was open range your cattle and horses run everywhere, and, and uh, you uh, worked. Or my dad worked horses uh, one morning, and I always got the horses in, and he changes for whatever two or four head of horses, and put new ones on in the afternoon, and worked about four hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon, mm -hmm. and but he only raised oats. I don't remember him raising anything else. Yeah. But uh, I remember my uh, mother driving this wagon and team, uh, and he said, uh, full of oats seeds, see, and they're going to plant a field. And so he says, you got to drive straight. And he sat in the back end and threw these oats out by hand. That's how he planted oats. Then it kind of, you know, we had the Herald. Well, that was where my job come in. I walked behind this four section Herald, and four head of horses on, and uh, soft dirt, you know. Oh, probably. They didn't farm it very deep, you know. Mm -hmm. And by gosh, they raised some pretty good oats, pretty good crops. Then all at once in uh, Hoover, got beaten, what, probably 29, 30. I think Roosevelt was elected in 32. So that must have been when uh, they went from a Republican president to a Democrat president. Mm -hmm. And Hoover, they blamed him for the Depression. Because, boy, in 29, things were really flourishing and people were bringing more people in and they were just coming in by droves, you know, from the east to uh, farm this good farm ground and, and where you could, uh, could just uh, run your cattle and horses wherever on this reservation land, but they more or less encouraged people to come in and, well, let them graze if 
then they put a stop to that though. <laughs> yeah, but uh, all at once then, it could be uh, 19, I'd say 30 dryers could be. They, they never read anything. Yep. And uh, you burn wood or coal, you know, to heat your homes with. And uh, boy, uh, then and Oh, 32, I think, was a pretty good year. We got a little rain that year mm -hmm. uh, when they needed it. And uh, uh, they planted, began planting uh, wheat. Of course, the wheat they planted then was spring wheat. There was no winter wheat. Mm -hmm. Then, if I remember right, in 1934 or 5, they experimented with winter wheat, and my gosh, Oh, if they could get the moisture, they had a better crop than the spring wheat by far. Mm -hmm. So then they, uh, in I think 36 or about then, they started summer following. You farmed your ground, kept the weeds off for one year, mm -hmm. then you planted the wheat in the fall and it come up and produced a crop. Didn't take but very little rain to produce a pretty good wheat crop. So the farmers... Uh, my dad never, he didn't farm, he was more cattle than anything. Yep. And uh, so uh, uh, they began the summer following, not because they wanted to, because they had to if they wanted to raise a, uh, a crop. Mm -hmm. And during that period of time, of course, we had high winds and hot weather, and we had grasshoppers that would uh, all just be... Uh, I don't know how thick on posts, fence posts, uh, and farms, buildings, and uh, they ate the crops up, and then they started poisoning them, and uh, I got in on some of that. You bought that from the government. They shipped the poison in, but you had to take your wagon and go get it, like in Martin, mm -hmm. who, or wherever they were. And they would, uh, I don't know, my dad took care of that, paying for it, I don't know, just the particulars there. And uh, we'd scatter that around the edge of the fields, and I'll be darned if it didn't keep, pretty much keep the grasshoppers under control so that crop could uh, grow and, and produce a, mm -hmm. a crop. So they got that problem pretty well whipped. But it was nothing to see a cloud of of grasshoppers above your head up between you and the sun, and it looked like a cloud. It would just be uh, where you were standing, if you were right under that just right, it would be uh, dark due to the darn cloud that the grasshoppers formed up there, and that's all it was. Mm -hmm. Bright sun and grasshoppers, you know, and... Uh, so uh, then, oh, they, by that time, I think that was about 19, oh, say, 35, they started poisoning suckers with an old airplane. Or you could do it in gate seaters of the team and wagon, too. But tractors were a big kind of, as these farmers moved in from the east, more and more people quit horses and they went farming with tractors, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a lot better, a lot faster. And then they got to using discs. And I think that was partly the cause of our dust storms where this disc uh, uh, powdered the ground up so that the wind didn't take much wind to really you'd have a ground blizzard mm -hmm. with dust just kind of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. around every field uh, that where, the, where they were doing, using the disc. And uh, so then we began, uh, now we're getting up in pretty close to 1940, uh, why they were... Uh, they were raising pretty good crops again, and I went to a CMTC camp 
1936 and mm-hmm. took some military training okay. up at Bismarck, North Dakota in Fort Lincoln. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, there was four of us from this area. Uh, we had to get all of our shots from the local uh, doctor here. And in 1936, the four of us uh, went to the to Fort Lincoln up there and took uh, 30 days of military training, CMTC training. And uh, then... uh, What did CMTC stand for? uh, Citizens Military Training. Okay. It was only for 30 days. But they they taught us the uh, the, uh, manual of arms and, and how to shoot a rifle. Of course, we... They were there, that we knew a little about, you know, mm-hmm. but not the way they taught it. Because, boy, that old 30 odd six, if you uh, didn't keep your thumb down along the side of the barrel uh, and put your thumb over like you do a lot of guns, you know, boy, you just cut your lip wide open there. Because that old, th- we, we either weren't strong enough or we weren't holding it right. But we soon learned to put that thumb down along the edge so when that recoil come back, it didn't hit you in the mouth. And, oh, a lot of guys, they just bled like uh, as if somebody had cut them with a razor or something. They, that's a, oh, they were sore. But they soon learned how to do that. And uh, one, the weather, oh, it was, 1936 was a, Terrible hot weather, a summer. Hotter than the people talking about out this summer. This was nothing. Mm-hmm. We went on a 20-mile hike from where we were, uh, from the fort out to where the rifle range was one day. We marched out there one day, and we had to take uh, our uh, practice on target practice there on the pistols, the 45 pistol and the, and the uh, 3030s, and and uh, uh, we spent all day on the rifle range. And guys, those kids that came in there, they're from the cities. Their feet weren't very tough. Well, they weren't like our feet, mm-hmm. and they get blisters on the sole of their feet as big as. Uh, pretty much cover the whole bottom of the foot, mm-hmm. and uh, we yeah, marched out there that day, and, and oh boy, we didn't know if we was going to make it or not, but we did. And when the sun, just before the sun went down, all of a sudden, some of these kids were getting uh, strokes from the sun, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you walk 40 minutes and rest for 20 or 15, something yeah. like that? And uh kid right beside of me, all of a sudden, he just stretched out. We were waiting for supper, see, and he just stretched out, so I just stiff as a board. So one guy, I said, you uh, take his feet, and I'll take his head. And uh, he, he, we just carried him over to the shade, you know, put him in the shade, and wiped his head with water, cool water. And uh, there was just all over the camp that this was going on. So they took them all back to Fort Lincoln in a, an old truck they had there. And, but uh, then the next day we marched back to, to uh, after the we got through with our training out there on the rifle range, where we went back to camp. And if you, the idea of, was that if you uh, went to that four years, four one month's training, you'd become a second lieutenant if you qualified and passed your test. Well, I, uh, uh, I was recommended to take the second year. But, gee, by then I was graduated from high school and, and I was in Cleveland going to school, so there was no way I could get any more. But I, uh, then comes the war, you know. Yep. Now we're in 1941, 40 and 41. 
and uh, I got um, finished them up in Chad in '40, and uh, they had a uh, pilot's training course that the government uh, gave us. Mm -hmm. well, it didn't cost us anything, but they wouldn't pay us anything either to <laughs> apply those Piper Krebs. So, but I went into that, so I got a private license in 1940 up there off of Shadron okay. uh, Air Base. And uh, by the golly, then when the war comes along, uh, while I get married, then I go to... I was thinking that I'd go up to School of Mines, maybe, and, and uh, take a few classes up there. Mm -hmm. I taught one year in 1940 in Nebraska, Bartley, Nebraska, but uh, then I went up to uh, the School of Mines and enrolled there, and uh, uh, they start in the Rapid City Air Base by guys. I could get a job uh, being a clerk uh, and testing these cement cylinders for strength so that we'd know what kind of concrete was being put on the aprons and on the dry, on the, mm -hmm. the runways, you know, there were specifications for each and, and uh, that way we controlled the mix so it, uh, they, uh, we're, we're, we're just started the uh, runway when I went to work there. And uh, uh, Irene and I were married in 1942, and, uh, and she was a nurse, and I was working there at the Rapid City Regional Hospital. Big salary, $50 a month. Mm -hmm. Well, Lordy, I could get 135 out the air base, so yeah. I quit the school there at Rapid and went out to, to really, uh, I, well, I didn't go even one semester, because this job looked pretty good, you know, and the war is coming on, and, and uh, you could see it, it's just a matter of time, and I think in 1941, December the 7th, I Pearl Harbor, the Japs, well, that made an altogether different deal out of it, you know. So uh, by then, though, I was, uh, they had transferred me from Rapid City up to Lewistown, Montana to help up there where they needed my qualifications. I, mm -hmm. I had a degree, and it made quite a lot of difference, you know. Uh, the boys that didn't have to go to school like I did, they made fun of me when I went to school. But then I could pretty well get a job. I just, boy, just nothing to it, you know. So uh, we moved to Lewistown and, of course, got a little more money, you know, a little promotion, and that's what it all worked for then. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, so then I decided that I would uh, take a test for an uh, Air Corps cadet, United States Army Air Force cadet. So uh, I signed up for that, and they called us in to Sturgis, South Dakota. There at, uh, what's the name of that fort there? Mead. Fort Mead mm -hmm. at Sturgis. And... There was about 50 of us, and we took uh, tests for the United States Army Air Corps uh, res Reserve, and uh, I, uh, uh, as a result of that, well, first I got orders to uh, go to Chinook Air Force Base in uh, communications. You know, telephone, radio, radio, and that kind of stuff. And uh, I no more and get that letter till here comes another one that cancels that one and says, we've decided to put you in meteorology at the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA. So you report to UCLA 
by sometime in November of 42. So, well, Irene by then, she's pregnant, and so she decides that she, she'll go home to her and uh, live with her folks until I get through down to UCLA, and then we'll know where I'll be stationed, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so she went, well, I left first. Uh, I, the snow was about 12, 16 inches deep up there, Lewistown in November. And God, it was, I was glad to get out of there. And she left too on the bus going, went to Winnipeg. Her folks lived in Winnipeg. Really? Canada. And uh, uh, so she went home and, and I went down to California and I began, I had four buckle over shoes on. And never forget, I got down to Salt Lake City and decided I didn't need four buckle over shoes and a, and a heavy uh, coat anymore. So I just took them off and set them on the bench and left them. I didn't have <laughs> no use carrying them around. <laughs> They weren't too good anyway, you know. And uh, so I go down to uh, UCLA and, and I report to the major. And, gee, I'll never forget. He looked up at me and he said, then where have you been? I said, you know, I've been trying to get out of that damn state of Montana where the snow's about 16 inches deep or deeper and, and uh, uh, so I could walk again. Well, he says, you're just the guy we're looking for. We've been waiting for you, wondering when you were going to show up. Well, I said, I'm here. What's, what's the deal now? He said, you're in, uh, in charge. You're the non-commissioned officer, cadet, in charge of three other captains, but you're the top captain and you're the, the, uh, we want you to take over these 250 uh, men divided up into four squadrons, or three squadrons, see. But there was a captain under each one of them, and then I was, geez, I said, what, what's the deal here? Well, he says, you're the guy we picked out of them to do what we want done. So then, uh, I never run into this before or since in the military. They also appointed me as a special agent to represent those cadets. And if I saw anything, uh, uh, anything peculiar out of the way, I was to report, I had to report anyway, every week to a mailbox, see. And I did, but we never had any incidences, uh, anything happened that I need to report, but I, I made my report, but uh, that, that was a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure the only reason that, that they put me in charge of that is that I had I had some 30 days of uh, basic training up at Fort Lincoln, and I'm sure as I'm sitting here that that's the reason they picked me to be, you know. Mm -hmm. So my schooling is finally beginning to pay off. I get $75 a month plus subsistence uh, rather than $30 like they were getting and 21 even when my brother went in, he got $21, but he didn't go to school, and so that's the difference. Very important. Mm -hmm. And I was just lucky that, that I had the opportunity to, you know, to get the schooling I need. Oh, gee, I'm getting in too much detail, aren't I? No, you're not. Nope. No? Just, it's just fine. It's... Well, we'll carry on then. Huh? Okay, let's do it. Uh, then, uh, uh, I, uh, of course, here's the funny part is, I knew how to march. Well, I had, I was, a, well, there was about five of us that weren't from Alabama, 
no, 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 Mississippi, East Texas, and that area. All the rest of these guys, uh, with the exception of the odd few, maybe from Colorado and Oklahoma, but they were primarily the Southern boys, see? Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, we had a couple of black boys in there. They weren't even allowed to sit with us in our classes. They sat way up in the top by themselves. I think there were four. And they graduated from schools like Texas Christian, you know, mm -hmm. and just same as, as most of us were college graduates because we were going there to take a special course in meteorology and it was in a, took us 11 months. And uh, then we'd be commissioned, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what we were looking for. We wanted that money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we wanted that extra money, you know. Yeah. And so, uh, oh, uh, one funny incident. Uh, New Year's Day in 1943. Well, it was about two days before. So it had been December 30th or so. All at once, somebody steals our wallets from our uh, gym, where we, you know, we had to take calisthenics and practice drilling every morning from eight o'clock till nine, and we'd dress in the gym and, mm -hmm. and go do that. And while we're out there, uh, uh, maneuvering and practicing and everything, why somebody stole our wallets? Hmm. So when we go in and discover this, gee, the boys are really upset. I said, well, just wait a minute. I said, you know, there's only one way to catch a crook. He'll come back tomorrow for more money. Because mm -hmm. we're all conscious we can all use a little more money here. At left, most of us anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some of these southern boys that are rich, but not from where I'm from. And so they all kept still, but the next morning we posted guards and we caught the kid. He was just a college kid there. His dad was a big, one of the biggest uh, prosecuting attorneys in L.A. at that time. And, and this kid stole, took our, our football tickets and what little money we had in there, which didn't amount to much, but we wanted to see that football game. And we got him back. His dad said he bet with me and, and the rest of the other three captains. And he says, well, what can you, what do you, how do you boys want to settle this? We said, we want our tickets back. And not only that, we want our money back. And I said to him, and how will you do that? He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. All you guys got to do is sign that you had a football ticket and that you had so much money, and I'll pay you if you don't prosecute. So we said, get the money. <laughs> <laughs> and we want those tickets, too. Yeah. So we got them back, and I don't know what they ever did. They kid nothing. And well, we got what we wanted, and we weren't going to be there only a few months more anyhow. Mm -hmm. So why the heck we didn't want to? Uh, we, but we never had anything like that happen again. And we saw the football game, and it was a lousy game, terrible. I think <laughs> they played Georgia. You yeah. know. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's that school's name in Georgia, that big engineering school? Georgia Tech? Well, well anyway, Sinkowitz is all I can remember. He was their quarterback and mm. hot shot player, and they beat UCLA. Terrible, terrible. It was just, well, as a matter of fact, most of us walked home before the game was over. It was so bad, you know. Uh, but anyhow, that that's just the funny part of of what happened to us down at UCLA, and uh, uh, boy, it's the best eleven months I ever spent in my life. For far as weather was concerned, 
Just imagine taking calisthenics at 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock every morning and never missing a morning. And it sprinkled one time and rained a half inch the 11 months we were there. I said, this is more like South Dakota than I thought it would be. <laughs> no rain, you know. And uh, so then uh, we all uh, graduate. I remember the Coliseum. Uh, we marched down there to get our commissions from the, 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 I mean, it was the colonel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was the boy, but not. Well, anyway, the commanding officer the, of that area came up there, and I had to march up and get the 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 uh, silver bars for the, everybody and and their certificates, you know, that we got. And uh, I, I, yet I can remember I'd never been in such a large stadium in my life. Boy, that's a big, big and they still use it today. Los Angeles uh, City uh, Coliseum. And uh, so then we get our orders, and my orders was uh, to go to uh, for a, uh, down here by McCook, Nebraska. Um, they had a little training school down there, and they sent me down there. And I know more than God, they said we'd probably be there about, oh, uh, five weeks anyway before we'd get overseas assignments. Mm -hmm. I think I was there five days. Anyway, Irene came down there. She just got there, and, and I think it was four days later or so, uh, I, uh, I guess here come these orders that I'm to report to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri for overseas shipment. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, she comes down there and, and we find a place to live. Uh, and uh, then uh, here comes this other order. So she starts packing up to go back to Winnipeg because she's going to stay with her folks, you know. And uh, so and I, of course, I didn't have anything just uh, our uh, army outfit that we had to buy when we were commissioned, you know. Mm -hmm. We got $250, by the way, to buy uniforms with. Geez, we thought we'll make some money on this deal. Out there, they barely paid for the uniforms. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't have much to get to pack, so uh, I got on the train and went to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. First thing I get there, the first assignment I get is to uh, um, uh, to, to uh, march. Uh, so many men, a uh, squadron or whatever it was, out to the rifle range for rifle practice. See? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and so I do. I, I, uh, of course, that's no problem for me. I know how to do that. I've done it enough times. And we go out there, and I know more and get my foot set on the, on the uh, ground. We marched, I forget, I don't know, it wasn't very far, 10 miles maybe or something like that. And I guess here they call me into the headquarters and says, the year we got to rush you. Uh, down to the uh, depot, uh, the railroad station, and you're to take a train to Fort Hamilton, New York. What? Yeah, here's your overseas orders, and you got to be there. And Lord, he just barely made connections. And uh, so uh, I get to Fort Hamilton, and they... Uh, uh, give me the overseas shot and yellow fever was one of them. And all of us that were there, yellow fever, geez, what in the world? Where are they going to send us? To, why did they send us to Fort Hamilton here in New York City if we got to go to the Pacific? Mm -hmm. Well, we get on this boat. 
then about three days, four days later, it just begins to get colder than the son of a gun. I mean, I said, Panama Canal, hell, we're going to Alaska or somewhere. <laughs> Mm. Because it's, uh, it was really chilly, you know. And the old storm was kind of bad, and the boat was uh, going up and down. And, and uh, all at once, here come a bunch of ships from the west, coming right towards where we're uh, out here in the Pacific, just going around in a circle, that's all we were doing, mm -hmm. waiting for these Canadian ships. Soon as they come in, boy, we take off for, I said, we're going to Europe. They go to the place in the world that uh, they'd send this by the uh, troop ships, you know, this is a convoy, boy. It was a big one. You could just see the destroyers way out there just uh, bouncing up and down all those ways, you know. And so they, uh, that's the way we went to Europe. And guess what? I no more than get to, to uh, I, I land at Belfast. Well, of course, I knew Ernie's people were there. So I uh, looked them up. I uh, had a little time there. Uh, and uh, I'm looking for Snugville Street and a certain number Snugville Street. And here's a little kid, Irish kid, just old, probably 10 years old. Yay! He says, where are, you, where, where are you going? I said, where's Snugville Street? He says, I'll show you. It's just that hole right there. <laughs> that's what he called them. That's what the Irish called them. <laughs> and they were, you know. It was just like uh, uh, every apartment had one door. And that faced the street. And that's where they went in and out. And the, But this kid said, there's the hole right there. <laughs> Uh, then I spent, uh, well, I was uh, in North Ireland, and I uh, got a promotion again. Hey, guys, mm -hmm. I don't want to get to North Ireland until they give me a promotion, because uh, I must have been one of the first second lieutenants that they promoted from the my class because they had a lieutenant there, the first lieutenant, but he had no discipline. He couldn't handle nothing. He was terrible. I, I felt sorry for him, you know. And uh, so they put me in charge of the three, four weather station that we have over in North Ireland. And, and uh, Patton's Third Army then is uh, moving in there and they're taking their training for the invasion. They're spotting the invasion. And my whole job, all this business, guess what? My orders was to get 15 Piper Cubs from North Ireland across the Irish Sea to Bournemouth, England by a certain day. <laughs> now that, that was my duty in the war. And, of course, guys, I picked the day, and they're ready, and everything worked out, and I never saw them again. So, but I got them over there. Of course, they had to have a tailwind, and they had to, this, but the Irish Sea's pretty doggone rough sometimes, you know, because mm -hmm. I've flown across it afterwards in airplanes that they flew so low to stay under the clouds. You could taste the salt off the Irish Sea, you know. So though it gets pretty rough, and you don't want to send in Piper Cubs and something like that, you mm -hmm. know. And so, but I, I got them across. And, but that, that, and other than just routine duty, that was the way I looked at. It was my contribution to World War Two, if you can imagine. But I guess it was necessary. Mm -hmm. And Patton, I met Patton many times. He'd come in the weather station and when he hollered attention, brother, you better snap too and drop what you're doing. Don't matter what you're doing. I, he's the general and he's the boy. 
Eisenhower come in right behind him the next day, maybe reviewing a, another division. Uh, and uh, Ike would say, well, Lieutenant, what, what do you got that they can use to go down there a mile or two to review the uh, certain division? And I said, uh, he, just the difference in the two people, see? Mm -hmm. And oh, we always, Jeep, all right, General? Fine. Of course, we weren't allowed to drive. Uh, officers were not allowed to drive in in uh, uh, the Eighth Air Force area in England or Ireland. You had to have a enlisted men drive your your uh, uh, Jeep. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Yep. Even the general, oh, of course, he wouldn't any. He would have a driver anyhow. But that's the only place where I ever had a, a sergeant drive me as a lieutenant. Uh, uh, you know, and we weren't allowed to drive over there. I never. I don't. That was just one of the peculiar regularities of the Eighth Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, all at once, the Third Army, I think. Roughly a million soldiers in North Ireland, the area, say, the size of Bennett County. Mm. Just think, a million Americans in there. And gosh, all at once, I go downtown. Not a, I'm the only soldier, or one of the only soldiers left in North Ireland. I said to myself, what's happened here? You know? Mm -hmm. And they pulled out that easy. They had that so well organized. One day we were just overrunning the town of Belfast and the side and the Irish uh, countryside. Mm -hmm. Next day, they're all gone. They're, so I said, uh-oh, the invasion is not far off. And about the next day, then there was a bad storm going in that area, too. And they went anyway. And just, it saved a lot of lives. Because uh, that storm behind it was one of these nice smooth storms. And, and you could predict exactly where it was going to be. And, and just as soon as, as that went by where they landed, of course, then the, the, they landed and... and uh, and I stayed in North Ireland and, and Scotland and England. I spent almost two years there, you know. Mm -hmm. And just routine weather forecast. Yeah. But I did the job I was supposed to do. I mean, you know, I always heard the Army, they never put you where you belong, but that wasn't true in my case. Mm -hmm. They trained me to be a meteorologist, and that's what I was. You know, mm -hmm. well, it was pretty important for the for the particularly for the bombing missions, wasn't it, to know what the weather was going to be? The bombing missions, yeah. Well, uh, sure, they uh, they uh, uh, they yeah they they uh, but they were flying uh, weather reconnaissance flights over Berlin all the time. Anyway, mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. And then they just come back. They didn't radio back. Could have, I don't. I think if they wanted to, but uh, they would fly over before the bombers went, just uh, check the weather or whatever, wind, because that that affected their bombing quite a little. Mm -hmm. I think I I, yeah. I never got one up in. I was stationed. And uh, and the Germans only hit Belfast, North Ireland, and destroyed thirteen churches. And uh, I was stationed down in England. And after that, when I first went there, of course, and uh, the German airplanes were bombing the, the England. Then, well, all at all at once, they stopped the airplane from bombing England. Then here come the V ones. The uh, buzz bombs, they look like a, a Piper Cub, you know, and they were just uh, like one night I was uh, morning, early in the morning, three, four, four o'clock in the morning, and 
out in the streets of London, and I look up, and there's a putt, 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 and of course, this sound is blowing. I said to an Englishman, what is that? They all clear the alert. He says, what the hell difference does it make? And I looked up, and there was a darn little old buzz bomb coming from the east, just going about a thousand feet over my head. So all I did is walk the other way, and I don't know, it landed, and boy, they carried a charge. And then the next, uh, then they started sending these rockets over. Oh, they were vicious. They just, they were real screaming meaties, we called them. Mm -hmm. And they had rock you in your old bed, I'll tell you, if they didn't even come close to hitting you. But, uh, uh, oh, just to tell you how people changed due to numbers, why, uh, when we were first there and the airplane was above us and everything, the, the English people, boy, you yanks, we sure need you here. We, we just don't know what we do without you. You know, when we stopped the airplanes from bombing, we stopped the raw V1s from bombing, we stopped the V2s from hitting them, oh, the same people said, Yank, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> Why don't you go home? Well, we went home, and that's, uh, that's uh, now let's see, what else? Now you want something else besides war. Yeah, yeah, well, you, uh, you, you get home, what happens then? Uh, well, I get home, and, and my brother, youngest brother... When did you get home? Did they send oh, you, I got send you home, home right after the war was over? Or was uh, oh, it? yeah, yeah, well... I had been in Europe long enough. They gave me my choice. Either stand in the Army of Occupations in Germany or else the Pacific. And if you take the Pacific route, we're going to, you have been in long enough. I go through the United States for 30 days for long. So I chose that route because I figured that, hell, if the you know, Japanese wouldn't last long if we all got to mm -hmm. chasing them, you know, because they practically had them whipped them when Germany gave yeah. over. And the war ended in Europe on May the 5th, if I remember right, uh, 1945, was it? 44, huh? no, 45, mm -hmm. I believe, yeah. And then uh, the Japanese war ended before I got uh, to the United States, mm -hmm. but I, I uh, come right home and then go into, uh, to, uh, uh, my orders were to go to uh, North Carolina to a training camp. Oh, they always got to give you more training, you know. Mm -hmm. You never know enough in the Army. They always got to give you some training, so my first orders was to go to this fort and in uh, North Carolina, and we, I uh, get my 30 days furlough, and I report down there for more weather training. They didn't say anything about going to the Pacific, that was all over with, you know. Yeah. So then they sent me down to, uh, I believe it was Kelly Air Force Base in Texas, Mm -hmm. So I was at Kelly, Randolph, and Bergstrom. Uh, all three of those air bases uh, for more training. And of course, this was mostly to get us oriented because in Europe, the uh, soldier officers, if there was a general or, or a colonel, you know, uh, why you saluted him and everything. But gee, we get down here in North Carolina. And we got even slew the car that's got a damn flag. Fl oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> we, uh, the, that's got a flag flying, see? Yep. There's an officer in there. Whether he's there or not, they're going to pick one up. Or, and so, boy, you had to salute that. And if you didn't, they'd call you in and chew the devil out of you, you know? So, I don't know. We All of a sudden, we decided, or I decided, uh, I don't want something different than this. I might have stayed in, but it, it was so much different than it was overseas, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, a certain amount of that's fine, I understand, but 
Uh, so as a result, as soon as I got uh, to Texas where I had a base, you know, where I made application to be discharged. And I got discharged April the 25th, 1945. Yeah. 1945. Okay. By golly, that war was over in 44 because it was May of 1944. May the 5th there, when the European war was over. Because, checks, I spent all the rest of that time and, until April before I actually got discharged in 45. Mm -hmm. And then I went home, and my brother, uh, he says, well, do you want to start farming and ranching? He says, I, I can lease some land and uh, uh, about 1,200, something more. 1,200 acres of grass and and, uh, and farm ground for, it was real cheap. And we got to buy it. So I had saved up $3,000 uh, over while I was in the military. Of course, he didn't have any money. That's what he needed was some money to get started farming and ranching, you know. And then, and so we decided that I'd go in with him and we'd go that route. Of course, we knew how to do that, you know. Uh, we were raised, and he was a pretty good uh, farmer. And so then we just uh, get started uh, with that in 45, and then in 46, why, uh, we planted a good crop, boy, it looked good, and it was good. And uh, here come the school board from Bennett County wanting me to teach math and science and coach the football team and, or finish the season out their coach had quit them. They got in some kind of a school hassle, you know. And so I agreed I'd... I'd finish out the year, and uh, uh, it worked out pretty good. Rex, he did the, most of the work on the farm and ranch, you know, and, and I had the money that it took to to get it started and get things going, and and, uh, uh, and I uh, taught for five years then before uh, I actually quit mm -hmm. uh, at the school there, and uh, it worked out good. And he got married, and, but his wife decided she didn't want to live in Merton. So uh, I said, well, I said, uh, there's no use fighting her, because uh, you can't do your job if there isn't peace in the family. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, uh, I'll just make you a deal. I'll pay you $10,000 for your share of this, or, or you pay me 10000 and I'll leave, whichever you prefer. So he says, well, I'll just, uh, I'll take you up, because that way he, he went down and he could buy, uh, make a down payment, I guess. And, I don't know, maybe pay for most of a section of farm ground and grass south of Gordon, you know, and that's where she was from and that's where she wanted to go back to. Mm -hmm. So that was just right. So he took the 10000 and uh, went back and I continued farming and teaching, well, a couple of years of that, I was doing both jobs, it's too much, so I decided not to teach anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I wanted more money than what they wanted to pay me, I, and uh, they they wouldn't pay me the money, so I just said, well, this is resigned, this is my last year. Now I'm strictly a farmer and a rancher. So then, of course, you know, just back from the air corps and everything, and, and I go to a, a co-op 
grain company meeting. They're just getting organized. They want to buy the co-op uh, or buy the elevator down to Merriman on the railroad. And, and uh, I said, yeah, I'm in favor of that. And uh, so I get, they put me on that board, you know. And then I run for a school board. And that's when we had common school districts and independent districts and all kinds of mm -hmm. different school ideas. And, and uh, I think in the independent, or the common school district, I was in the first time I ran for uh, the board. There was 27 votes there, and I think I got every one. Mm -hmm. So I must have voted for myself. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, so uh, then uh, we get the elevator, bought as only a $20,000 deal, and uh, uh, we took up a collection amongst the, the members of the board. And I said, well, boys, I said, you know, I need all the money I got. You guys were here farming, and you got a little money. You put the money in, and I'll help on the board of directors. But I said, God, I can't, I just can't give you any amount of money. Uh, you know, in my position, I needed all to buy supplies with and tractors mm -hmm. and feed and seed and everything. Oh, well, that's fair enough. So then <coughs> we go down on Lake Creek south here and putting up hay that summer of about 19... 49, probably 50. <coughs> then I go to town Saturday night. Uh, no, I bet uh, the guy, uh, my neighbor, Wilford Johnson. Hey, Clinton, he says, come here. We elected you as as one of the directors of La Creek Electric. I said, boy, Wilf, I've pretty got enough of those. Oh, he says, you'll like this. We need you on there anyway. So, I, <coughs> being that they'd already elected me on, why I didn't go to the meeting, I was a hand down there. And uh, so I agreed to go on. And I spent 39 years on the Rural Electric, uh, 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 La Creek, <coughs> Rural Electric uh, Association. <coughs> Then we organized, uh, I, I used to say that if I'd spent as much time working for uh, myself as I did for other people, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> I was on so many boards, you know, and, and boy, uh, I, they, uh, I would get on the Rushmore board then. And I think I was on that board, uh, see, 21 years. 20 years, roughly. I don't know exactly now. Uh, and uh, then I get on the big board, Basin. And, uh, and, and uh, boy, that was different yet. Uh, we were borrowing so darn much money, I thought, gee, I don't know how in the world this is ever going to work. You know, the creek's a little, I, that, that didn't bother me. Rushmore is a little bigger, but that didn't bother me. The boy bases when they started borrowing way up in the millions or maybe more to build a power plant. The first one, over a half a million. And they had sent me to New York City to, the, to uh, represent a basin and uh, see if they were having an argument over uh, what kind of a boiler they were going to put in, you know. Mm -hmm. And we settled that and, and got the plant in operation. And from there they built another unit out there and they built the a uh, big, big power plant down at Wheatland, Wyoming. Have you ever seen that one? I've been down there. Yeah. yeah when they were back in the 70s, I think. Oh, that was before we got that finished then. Yep. 
and uh, I spent uh, uh, oh gosh, 15, 17 years on the basin board, and uh, and then I'm up for election, but we decided we had bought the gasification plant, you know, the great uh, plains gasification plant there at Beulah. Uh, Basin had bought that, and we were trying to sell the byproducts. So the manager, I was chairman of the board then, and the manager and I decided we'd to, uh, maybe we should go to uh, France and England and, and Belgium and see if we could sell some of these uh, byproducts, you know, Mm-hmm. And uh, we could really pay for this plant then, this gasification plant. And uh, so we go over there, and I'm up for re-election at La Creek that same spring in May. And uh, he, at the manager of Basin, said, "Well, you know, you're up for re-election. Maybe you better not go on this trip and stay home." Oh, I said, I think uh, they'll vote for me. I I don't know if there's anything, you know, a two controversy that uh, that they were, why they wouldn't vote for me. Mm-hmm. But then we get word that I get defeated uh, on the local level. Well, that means I'm off of everything. So that ended my rural electric career. But we were over there, and you know what we found out in this trip? We found out with that they needed the same thing as we needed, more finer tuning, more uh, uh, experimental deals so that uh, they could use the product, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was too much waste, see, and it cost too much to just get rid of the waste. And we, they... They had the same problem as we did. If we would refine it to where they didn't have that cost, they'd buy it. But otherwise, there was no point in it. So that's the end of my rural electric career in a f- few words. I spent, um, I, enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed it, and uh, I, I don't, no longer, I'm too old now. I, I don't have, I have no intentions of, well, they wanted me to, what was it they wanted me to be on the other day? Oh, they wanted me to, to go up here in the American Legion with the American Legion. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a 50-year member, you know, or more, uh, to the school. And, and uh, I said, no, I, I decided that I'm not going to, to uh, well, I'm just too old. I just... Couldn't, wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't be able to make it because uh, of my health, and, and mm-hmm. it's pretty good, but you never know. Yep. You know. Yep. What was the process uh, like in getting, uh, when you first were getting uh, electricity down here? When you, when, was, when you went on the board the first time, was that when they were being organized down here? Yeah, excuse me. I, yeah. I got to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And maybe a drink of water might help you too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got that 50 year plaque. I mm-hmm. guess I haven't put it up yet. Yeah. Now, what was your. Uh, the process of getting electricity down here was it different than further east? Uh, you know, you had these. You had a lot of Native Americans down here, and they're living in little communities all over the place. Oh yeah, they, they said you can't pay for your electricity. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, I got in on uh, on uh, almost the very beginning, not mm-hmm. quite. Yeah. Well, I got in on when they got electricity. Okay, I'll start. Let's see. I was elected in uh, 1950. I was elected on the Lake Creek Board. Mm-hmm. Is this on now? Yes, it is. Yep. And 1950, June 1950, I was elected on the Lake Creek Board. And uh, 
they have been organized for about uh, two years. And uh, so, by gosh, uh, we had a, practically a change of board. Uh, I mean, us young guys, they, and we uh, we could have beat the president of the United States probably, you know, because mm -hmm. we were that popular. Yep. Uh, and no, I, don't I mean, that's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of you were veterans probably. Yeah. Yep. Most of us. Yep. Not all. All we had the, some older guys on too, but they had the money, but you needed yep. them. Okay, we uh, decide that uh, it's time we got electricity. I said, well, let's either get electricity or, or find out if we can get it or else not. Because that's why I agreed to stay on. I'm in favor of, of uh, having electricity for all the farmers in our area and in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, just like the city people. There's no reason why we can't have it if they can. And we'll pay for it just like they do. And so uh, we uh, get uh, the Secretary Wickard. Was he Secretary of Agriculture then? Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was. I think he was the Secretary of Agriculture. Because the Secretary of Agriculture had the final say, you know, in those days. Uh, it wasn't, REA wasn't very big then. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, uh, we got the Democrats to, uh, on the board to push him, to get him to come out here and see what it would take for us to get electricity. Mm -hmm. You see, in the beginning, the Democrats controlled everything. Yeah. I mean, uh, I went on very few boards as a Republican that uh, if you weren't a Democrat, you didn't get on. Mm -hmm. Because they, the, all the Democrats just had the, the majority of the votes. And, yeah. and uh, so, by golly, we get record to come out. And our Elmer Solid... Uh, who was the chairman of our board, and uh, I think the banker, Hodson, and you know, there's a guy from Batesons on the board, and I can't think of his name. These guys are all dead. I'm, yeah. I'm the only live one of the bunch. <laughs> okay. And uh, so uh, uh, the uh, secretary, or the the Wickard comes out and Elmer takes him for a ride, shows him the country, all around through the country, the good farm farms and the bad and the cattle and the wheat and what we grow. Okay, Wickard doesn't say anything. And Elmer brings him back and we, of course we got a board meeting and have a little... Mm -hmm. Uh, something to eat and sure. some coffee and so then we get in session and he says well how do you guys figure on paying for this electricity he says first of all you've got no milk cows secondly you don't raise very many hogs and he says I don't see very much corn raised how in the world uh, I'm from Iowa, but how in the world are you going to pay for this electricity? Elmer says, we don't need anything but wheat to pay for this electricity. <laughs> A good wheat crop will beat all of those things here and less work. Oh, well, I guess the old boy at least scratched his head and said, no, huh, I never thought of that. And then Elmer says, well, what about cattle? Oh, yeah, you do have a few cattle, don't you? Oh, he <laughs> says, and I did see a horse or two. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he th thought, he says, uh, after I don't know, an hour or so, he said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do, make you guys a deal. He said, Bird 
The guy in Viva Bird owns a power plant in Martin. You got to have Martin to start with, because I won't talk anything until you buy out the power plant that's in existence, because we don't want we want the town of Martin. Mm -hmm. At least we want that much, and otherwise it's no deal. And so I think Bird won fifteen thousand dollars for. Uh, so it was a big power plant, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Only serving Martin, I suppose. Only serve Martin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. shucks. Uh, in those days, the power that it took to serve Martin wasn't very much. Yeah. And uh, so uh, Albert says, well, that's no problem. And uh, I think they took up guys that gave them $15,000 right there from the board. Well, here's me in the same position. God darn it, I've been gone. I haven't, you guys been making this money. I, I said, I'll help you on the board, but I, darn it, I, I'm not in position to, mm -hmm. I borrow money from the banker. I said, i operate. I don't, uh, I haven't got any hardly. And uh, so, heck, I think they really get the $15,000. <coughs> Went down and saw Bird and bought the power plant and bought Martin. Wickard says, Good, I told you what I'd do and you've done it and you're in business. Now I'll get to producing electricity so and we'll come up with a, a system so we can serve this area, La Creek. Mm -hmm. And uh, we named it and everything that night. And he agreed to it and, and they had the money to, and Wickard, you, you couldn't see how the expression changed on his face when these guys all wrote out the checks for, well, I think one guy for almost 5000 or another one for five, and I think they only need another five. And I think they just come up with the money right there. The banker and was there and two or three other people, you know. Mm -hmm. So we're in business. Now we got La Creek to go on and, and we started uh, making applications uh, for the first uh, A district uh, unit uh, area, uh, which took in the town of Martin and a little bit more, about, mm -hmm. about the township of Martin, the first area. Mm -hmm. And they rebuilt the lines and got good power First of all, they had to get some power from the river. That was a hard part because yeah. they didn't have any good lines, you know, then. <coughs> but uh, they didn't really have too much electricity to sell early either because they they were getting to where they wanted to sell some, you know, but they didn't have her yet to where they had the transportation, the power lines to uh, do it. And uh, uh, we just went from that to uh, another section until we got the whole area done, which took oh, several years. Mm -hmm. and then here come the group from Merriman, these ranchers. They come up and they want to know if they can get in on this uh, La Creek area so they can get their power cheaper because NPPD was charging them just like they lived in the city, see? Mm -hmm. And you know what uh, what uh, irrigation would cost. And of course, they, yeah. they, that's what they were really interested in because mm -hmm. they wanted to irrigate some yeah. land for hay, see? And uh, so uh, they said, huh, you farmers can never pay for anything. When it gets tough, you fall back on us ranchers to make the payment on this power plant. We said never. <laughs> you just pay your share. That's all we ask of you. Mm -hmm. And then we took them in. Uh, but see, everybody, they think they got the best deal, you know. Sure. Wickard, but he was broad-minded enough. He could see where they didn't have to have milk cows. And they didn't have to feed hogs, you know. <coughs> and uh, so uh, La Creek just grew, and, 
And then we had the, the, uh, the they got the dams going and they got the electricity uh, transmission lines built. And then you had to determine how much electricity you were going to use in five years and ten years. So the, the, part of the Bureau wanted to sell all the electricity they produced, not just some of it, you know. Sure. And so as a result, Nebraska Public Power District, they even get them to build a transmission line from Hawaii clear to uh, Grand Island, Nebraska, to transport this surplus, if they have any, so many uh, firm, so much firm power, so much uh, uh, mm -hmm. other power, you know, it's clear to uh, Grand Island, Nebraska. That's how they, Grand Island, or the, or the, uh, the state of Nebraska, uh, through their public power district, gets power from our dams because they they even got uh, the government built the uh, 345 kV transmission line to Grand Island so that they could get rid of all the surplus and boy mm -hmm. that just made the, just what the bureau was wanting but then in a few years our consumer says hey how come we can't get more power from the river Hell, we sold it all. Yeah. <coughs> we had to. You guys didn't have any money. You wouldn't. You just bought a little part of what we could produce. So the rest of it, we got this deal in Grand Island uh, to accept the transportation. You know, the transmission line down there, and the government uh, built that too. And, and uh, of course, they had to help pay for it and mm -hmm. everything. But it, uh, that's how we really got, uh, uh, at one time, our goal when I first went on the board was that we're going to have one cent electricity. And we come within very, almost a penny electricity for everybody in the creek area, but not quite. But uh, that's how cheap it was, mm -hmm. you know, the river power. But that's when we were getting <coughs> all the power was coming from the bureau, and I, said, I guess that takes care of that, huh? Mm-hmm. So and, you have to go with basin. Huh? Oh, oh. You know, well, oh yeah. Well, then see the same thing happens. I mean, we formed Rushmore mm -hmm. to take care uh, to provide us with uh, more power because the bureau says. Well, they, this is all you had bought. This is all you're going to get, mm -hmm. whatever that amount was. And that was a hundred, almost 100% at one time. Oh. Well, it was 100% at one time. Then we formed Rushmore in 1950 or 52. And, of course, they, you know, they were a paper organization only to start with, you know. And that's really all they are now. But they, uh, are, uh, they represented... The GMT, mm -hmm. our uh, co-op that supplies the power, you know. Yeah. So then I'm on the Rushmore board, and then uh, we Rushmore hasn't got any place to buy any power on the bureau. So we formed bases in order to generate power. Not to uh, be a, a, a transmission co-op, just to generate power, you know, because we got to have power, okay. <coughs> and so we hired Jim Grawl as the manager of Basin. Jim was anti, uh, anti uh, atomic energy. He'd been in the Navy, he'd been in a submarine. At that they had had uh, rebuilt and uh, at one time and to use atomic power and not uh, any other kind of diesel power or anything else. But uh, so Jim was and I. He said, "Go away! Are we going to build a goddamn? I don't want. I don't like that atomic power." So we said, "Well, let's go coal route then." 
because we know oh, North Dakota's got a jillion tons of coal and Wyoming's got millions and millions and hundred foot themes for miles on end, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have power for a long time if we can either use coal from either field. We're sitting right in the right spot to use it, you know. So then we uh, built the unit one up at, uh, in North Dakota there <coughs> at Mandan. They're not Mandan, but Beulah, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. They built unit one, and I was in on building, you know, all of building unit two. And, uh, and then we uh, built the Laramie River Station but uh, we only get so much of that production. And then the next power plant we built was over Beulah, the present one, uh, Antelope Valley. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a big uh, generating plant. And then, by guys, all at once, why uh, the gasification plant goes belly up and they want to sell it before they do. They're just ready to shut her down. So by golly, uh, uh, we uh, talked REA into loaning us some money to, to uh, or no, no, I don't think so. Excuse me, not REA. The bank for co-ops, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, oh, oh, we had another uh, finance organization too that could loan us money, but not the REA to buy the gasification plant. Uh, that was not financed by government money, but it was financed through us uh, mm -hmm. and these other. They were same thing but different names. See? Yeah. And uh, uh, so we uh, get the gasification plant, and it's making money hand over fist now. Oh boy. But it looked sick there for a while. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it looked bad. We said, gee, we got a per we got the coal, we got to make her work. And then they, uh, see, the, the idea the, that we sold the gasification plant on was, well, gosh, we're throwing away all these fines, see? Mm -hmm over there at the uh, power plant because they can't use that real fine coal. T too much to, uh, uh, ashes and stuff, see. Mm -hmm. So they could take this power of this gasification plant, which needs these fines, you know, to make gas, natural gas with, and uh, well, then the rest, uh, the good coal, the chunk coal, We'll sell to our power plant over there, and that's what they need. So there we'll process the coal for both places, you know. Mm -hmm. And it just worked out fine. Okay. And then I went off the board in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, uh, defeat. Yeah. yeah, and you went on the, you were in, uh, inducted into the Co-op Hall of Fame in 1995, I see up there on the plaque. 1995, yeah. yeah, that's a co-op Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Well, that was for South Dakota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, boy. That was because of what I'd spent 38 years, sure. I guess, on La Creek and mm -hmm. Rushmore, you know, and basin and, and uh, awesome. I had my choice one time. A guy came to me and wanted me to run for uh, the state senator, I believe, mm -hmm. to become a state senator. Yeah. He took his name was Jensen, either representative or senator. Mm -hmm. Oh, he says, Quentin, we'll get you elected, no problem. Why don't you forget part of this rural electric stuff and go uh, be a senator, one of our representatives in Pierre? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, i got to think about that for a little bit. 
And uh, I came up with the conclusion that I didn't want to get involved in politics. I wasn't a politician because uh, what, what I said is the way it was or else I didn't say it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel that politicians were uh, necessarily of that opinion. Yeah. So uh, I think I'll stay out of politics and I'm going to stay with the rural electrics because I still think we need electricity to the rural areas. I was born in South Dakota and raised in South Dakota and mostly on a ranch. Although I was born right over here a quarter of a mile. See, what yeah, right over here mm -hmm. where there was a house sitting that nobody wanted and we lived in it, I guess. <coughs> <coughs> and so uh, I decided to go the co-op route and I said, I can't take on both. Because I said, I got to tell you, make a living too at home because these, these things don't pay good enough to, for me to make a living for a family. Mm -hmm. yep. And so I said, I'm going to pass that enough so I wouldn't run for representative or senator or state, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. So you uh, you spent a lot of time with the rural electrics. And there, there are some other co-ops around here, and they've not been rural electrics are still doing well around here. Yes, providing electricity. Yes, uh, and uh, you have a telephone co-op down here. You and the uh, oh yes, Golden it's West. Golden West. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's doing good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of other communication services these days besides just telephone too, right? Uh, you Could, mean on yeah. the internet? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I, I see the uh, Indian population now, they got a special deal and they're all, what, dollar for a phone? Mm -hmm. With that little hand phone, you see them all. Now, boy, they, they got, they're they going around <laughs> talking just like everybody else when they yes. should be driving. Yeah. Uh You've got some other cooperatives around here that have had a little bit of trouble. Um, I, I noticed one has sold out down here on Main Street or down on the highway. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit, what happened to them? Oh, the co-op, yeah. right? Yeah. <coughs> I think you mentioned that the Green uh, Elevator Cooperative went under, too. Well, you know, I never was on the oil co-op board. Mm -hmm. It started back in uh, 19, uh, oh, say 37, mm -hmm. 38, okay. long in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they hired uh, a manager and uh, it did all right. And uh, then he quit. I retired, really. And uh, they've had several major since. And they've done good and bad and, mm -hmm. and always kept the doors open. Yeah. Well, then uh, I, they, I, I really don't know what the problem is. Why the, they, they couldn't hire the right manager or something. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. they uh, just like the green elevator. They claimed they couldn't hire a manager that knew how to buy and sell grain under these conditions. Mm -hmm. And evidently, the, our oil co-op and I've always belonged to it and yep. always did business with it. Yep. And, and yet, I never had any desire. I had enough boards. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't have any desire to be on there. And so really, I, 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 I can't, I don't think I should tell, speculate on what okay. the reasons are. Okay. I think, though, it's because they, they just couldn't hire uh, a, a good manager. Mm -hmm. that, that's my, that's my own philosophy, though. Sure. Okay. Uh, you, you've had 
a variety of co-ops around here. You still have the rural electric and the telephone. Uh, what was the relationship between, you got a lot of Native Americans out here. Did they ever participate? Or, uh, oh, sure. They all belong. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially in the rural electrics. Yeah. Oh, all of them are members. Mm-hmm. Every one of them that's in, except uh, you get west on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Yeah. Well, then uh, uh, Nebraska started serving that in the early 1900s when there was uh, oh, just a, a agency there. Mm-hmm. And it was government money, of course. Sure. And then... then uh, 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 Nebraska Public Power District would have a well. We couldn't serve them. We couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. The facilities too. Until we we tried to buy it. We we thought about buying Pine Ridge proper, mm-hmm. but they're oper- They're served by Nebraska Public Power District and have been ever since Pine Ridge was uh, in existence. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. You you you've got kids. Uh, one of them at least involved in farming? You, you oh, yes. My son, he, uh, I turned uh, everything over to him and the grandson. Okay, what's his name? Uh, Dallas. Okay. Dallas. And, uh, you got a grandson, too? It's, hmm? You have a grandson that's involved, too? I agree. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a son. There, there's, it's big enough that we're all involved in it now. We all own part of it now. Mm-hmm. But it's big enough so they can... Make a li- see. This is the secret to these farming deals. Mm-hmm. Have a place efficient enough and yet big enough, so one or two or however many families got to live can live mm-hmm. beyond the poverty level. Yeah. See, the my, all I ever heard when I was a kid, well, you're a poor farmer, you know. Mm-hmm. But now uh, uh, we got smart poor farmers and they're <laughs> making some money. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and they're big enough to, to, uh, so that all the people involved are getting well paid, mm-hmm. and that's what it takes. Yeah. How many times did I mention money on my, you know, coming up through the steps? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You got to make money. Yep. Because you can't live on air, and nobody's going to feed you. You yep. got to. You gotta make money, and as long as you're making money, you're satisfied. Mm-hmm. Oh, there should be. Yeah, yeah. Would you say you are retired now, or uh, are you kind of like some farmers? You are still doing some stuff. Or no, uh, when I reached eighty-five, mm-hmm. I retired, and I bought this house, mm-hmm. and we moved in here, and I don't. Uh, I can't tell you what the boys are doing today or or what they're doing tomorrow unless I see them somewhere just like anybody else. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I know they're weaning kids or something, you know. Yeah. I, I have no control. Well, I don't say I don't have any control, <laughs> but I, I don't I have any operating. I don't do any work out there. I help them a little. Mm-hmm. If they're weaning or branding calves, uh, but it's the only little I can do. I, I discovered that I can't work like I used to. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to everybody at some yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. But when I was 85, I quit. I said, you guys, if you can't run this, boy, you're out of luck because uh, uh, you got all. Uh, nobody can buy my land because it's not for sale. Okay. Well, I've got a co- just a couple of questions left here. Uh, one of them that I ask everybody is, Are you? would you describe yourself as an optimist or a pessimist? And I think I know what your answer is going to be. Optimist. Yeah, yeah. I actually interviewed a guy uh, uh, this week who was a card-carrying optimist. He was a member of the Optimist oh, Club. Oh, is that right? Leroy Shecker, you may remember. Oh, Leroy Shecker. He used to manage uh, the co-op up at Grand, Grand Electric. Grand Le- yeah. Oh, Leroy. Yeah, oh, yeah. We used... wrap it now. Oh, He's retired. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, there, most of the people that I knew are all retired, <laughs> except Nelson. He's still manager of East River. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and one last question. Is there anything that I 
that I haven't asked you. you you've volunteered most of the stuff that I have to ask people usually, so it's a, it's a good interview. Well... Any, anything else you'd like to add? I, th- I, really, I wonder if we haven't gone too long. No, we're okay. My, my battery is still going. I got two hours on my no, battery. No, but so. I mean for whatever use you're going to use of this. See, mm-hmm. I'll tell you, I had a little experience. A guy came in and wanted to do similar, something similar. Mm-hmm. Take my life history yeah, and, sure. and write it up. I think he gets paid from the paper. See? Oh, okay. I'm not sure of that. Yep. Okay, but uh, we get. I keep telling him. We spent two days at that, and I said, you know, we're getting pretty long. <laughs> we're, we, well, think, you were well prepared before I got here then, having done, done a longer one with the, the, the newspaper. Well, but this was done a long time ago, several years ago. Oh, okay, okay. Two or three, four years ago. I've, oh, well, I remember. But I just told you about what, mm-hmm. uh, I guess what you wanted to hear. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, okay. Uh, I, I don't know. If we haven't gone too long, I, I think. All right. We've been visiting with Quentin Loudon. Thank you for participating in the Cooperative Legacy Project. And we have just an addendum here of the uh, interview. Uh, Quentin, you want to talk about your daughters? Well, the family. The family, say, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, Irene and I were married in 1942, and uh, we have a daughter, Judith, uh, who uh, was born in, in uh, 1943, and uh, she has a business of her own in uh, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, and then we have another daughter by the name of Jane Yox, Y-A-K-C-H. Uh, she's a nurse at Swedish Hospital uh, and uh, has been there. She graduated from the University of Wyoming, mm-hmm. or University of Nebraska, yep. uh, Colorado. Well, I'll get it right soon. <laughs> but she graduated from the University of Colorado in nursing. And she's worked for Swedish ever since she graduated from uh, college. Mm-hmm. And she's still working there. She, and uh, I, I suspect she'll retire there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Keith, he's uh, and uh, his son Dallas are operating in... Uh, Someday they'll own all the the ranch, and mm-hmm. that's what they want. Mm-hmm. They they own part of it now, and uh, I don't know, see Keith. Uh, he has two daughters besides Dallas, and Dallas has a son and a daughter. Okay, and I think that's enough. Mm-hmm. Okay, but okay. but if I didn't get those girls in uh, estate planning. Oh, that's how yeah. do you how do you do you only get this on? Uh, no, I, I'll turn it off. Yeah, 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 I, I'll turn it off.